Okay, Janelle. Okay, excellent. Okay. Okay, I'd like to call the special plan commission meeting to order on Tuesday, October 5th, 2021 at 6.03 p.m. Janelle, could you please take roll call? Hurdle. Here. Zashki. Here. Bretzmacher. Here. Shumwe. Here. Schmitz. Here. And Bell. Here. Comments, correspondence, and concerns from the public. Is there anybody joining us tonight that would like to address the plan commission on a non-agenda issue? I will take that as a no. <clears throat> Is there a motion to approve the agenda? I would like to amend uh, the agenda tonight. And under item number one, public hearing, I would like to delete the I-1 and P-1 zoning districts from the public hearing. And the reason that I would like to do that is that uh, we did not discuss these previously and uh, they were put into um, the public hearing because the, the dimensional, uh, the setbacks and other things were, um, uh, the tables were added and the wording was taken out, but we did not actually review any of that. So that is why I would like to delete those and we will address them at a later date. So moved. Motion by Schmitz. Second. Second by Grutzmacher. All those in favor, respond with an aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Carried. Item number one, public hearing regarding several proposed amendments to the zoning code for the village of Sister Bay, including deletion of 660310, second dwelling unit overlay district in its entirety, and amendment of the following sections of the zoning code. General zoning standards, R1, R2, R3, R4, CS1, B1, B2, B3, and zoning code definitions. Bo? Yes, um, so if you would like to speak um, on behalf of the, you know, for the public hearing, I would ask that you please message me in the chat um, with your name so that I can get a list in order. Um, does anyone want to speak on behalf um, for the zoning code changes that are being presented tonight? Let me just state that at 606, we will open the public hearing. I don't have any names right now, so I don't have a person to begin the public hearing discussion. So we'll wait until someone either messages me or wants to speak. Okay. Well, um, Perhaps it would be a lot easier for the public attending rather than saying I1 and P1 to note the pages that were deleted from tonight's discussion so everyone knows succinctly what is still on the table tonight. Okay, so uh, Bjorn Johnson wishes to speak and then I believe uh, Lars Johnson would like to speak afterwards. Okay. Hello, everyone. Can you all hear me? Yep. Yep. Okay. So I'm going to speak first, and then my dad, Lars Johnson, is going to speak secondly. He is in the room with me. Um, we're just going to do this one computer at a time here. Um, so tonight, I am here on behalf of Al Johnson's. I have permission to speak and authority on their behalf. Um, what brings us here tonight, we are opposing one revision that is currently in the amendment. And then secondly, we, are, we will be suggesting and asking for one new revision to the amendment as it currently stands. So I'm going to begin first most with what we are opposing, and it's primarily the, the tent regulations that is under 66.0302 sub D sub 8 which way of background was originally 
provided as the temporary sale of goods from a truck, trailer, a table, or a tent shall only be permitted as part of a festival permit issued by the village board, and that the tents shall be removed from the site within 10 days following the temporary activity. As you know, the amendment as it currently stands, it is amended as such that temporary tents are prohibited on commercial properties unless they are used in accord with a festival permit issued by the village board and or the parks, properties and streets committees. And then secondly, the 10 day removal period is reduced to 48 hours. So we are first most here in opposition to this amendment for several reasons. Number one, we believe that as part of our operations and just the general vision of how we've been operating the last three years and into the future, we think events and large scale gatherings that requires a large scale tent have been a key and essential part of our operations thus far and will be into the future. They, secondly, the tents in general have allowed us flexibility, especially during COVID. We think that <clears throat> Commercial businesses should have the option to erect such a thing that is when it, when it is not in connection with the festival issued by the village. Thirdly, we think it allows for a non-committal to any kind of permanent structure during any kind of outdoor expansion projects. I think a good example would be the original Shook kitchen that we had outside at Stabur, and then secondly, the band tent. And it, uh, it can serve as something that can allow us to continue operations while not necessarily committing to a permanent structure right away. Fourthly, and I think this was alluded to by some of the plan commission members in the past, it seems to us the village is slightly inconsistent with this regulation in the sense that it is trying to stop tents on commercial property, but then not so much on village owned property. And it's my understanding that you could still rent village owned property out along the shoreline and still erect a similar style of temporary tents. So I th we think if the goal here behind this regulation is primarily aesthetics and just the general look of the downtown area, then we think this regulation is severely under broad and not necessarily tailored towards advancing its objective. So we would say either regulate all of it or none at all. And I think secondly, regarding the 48 hour period, we think it's too short. We think the 10 day period allows for some windows. For example, like this coming weekend with Columbus Day through Fall Fest, it really wouldn't make any sense to take down a tent after two days only to put it back up, assuming that we can still use these types of tents when it's not in connection with the festival. So I think in conclusion on the first part of our opposition, we would say oppose altogether or at the very least allow commercial businesses to receive a similar approval process like you can on the village properties on the shoreline for a rental. So, which leads me to the second reason why we're here tonight. And I think this is an alternative and also in addition to our opposition to the tent regulation. So secondly, tonight we are suggesting and asking for the plan commission to include assembly halls as a conditional use in the B3 zoning district. And I think I'll give the commission just a little bit of background because I think it's been largely absent from the discussions thus far these past few months. So assembly halls are defined under the definition provision of the code as a facility facility designed and or operated for the gathering of 50 or more people for private or commercial functions. For example, an event conducted for the purpose of hosting a party, banquet, wedding, reception, or other social event. So this was originally included in 2017 as a conditional use in the R3, CS1, and B1 districts, and then later was removed from R3 districts in 2019. So our suggestion here is to include assembly halls into the, in the B3 conditional use section that would be in addition to liquor stores, solar energy accessory structures, non-village utility facilities, gasoline stations, permitted accessory uses, 
outdoor displays and professional offices, assuming also that commercial recreation facilities are removed under the current draft of the amendment. So a little bit of a rationale for this. We think that first and foremost, in connection with the events, it would allow some of the commercial properties that would be hindered by what we think is the removal of the, of the large scale tents to potentially have the option of having somewhat of a permanent event facility. And we think this might be part of the reason why some commercial properties are deferring to temporary temps, tents simply because they don't have the means of hosting such events at a facility that could accommodate X amount of people, which is fairly large for these types of events. And secondly, I think kind of to bring up a nuclear bomb here, we think that this is also consistent with potential future discussions regarding the village hall, which we also think has been largely absent over the discussions over the last few months. And to be very clear here, this isn't a moment to really litigate the future of the village hall, but potentially just to provide the village an alternate option if it were to consider the final stages of opening up the entire waterfront. <clears throat> And, and the reason is we think it would be strongly consistent with good public, public policy for the village to potentially allow a private business to assume some of the functional aspects of such a facility like the village hall in the B3 area. So we think that is overall consistent with the future of the vision of the downtown area, and it could provide for solutions to a number one of public policy issues facing the village into the future. First of all, the lack of event opportunities, and secondly, potentially giving the events that are currently hosted at the village hall over to a private business if it were to choose so. So I think lastly, we can conclude here that our ask first and foremost is to include assembly halls as a conditional use in B3. So I think Jorn, with, could you clarify something for me? Because yeah. I'm trying to take notes. So as I'm writing, sometimes that I am missing a little bit of, of what somebody is saying. So can you reiterate um, when you started talking about the village hall and I only got as far as private business and I didn't I didn't catch the rest of, of the that sentence. Yeah, so we think that a private business in the B3 zoning district could assume some of the operational events that the village hall currently assumes at the moment as a public facility. And we think that it would be strongly consistent with public policy into the future to give a private business the option to have a facility like the village hall to where maybe one day the village hall's current events could be transferred to such a private facility. So are you implying that the village hall would be sold to a private business to operate it as an assembly hall? Oh, please. <clears throat> Sorry, Marjorie, were you trying to say something? No, I was caught ready to cough. Oh, Sorry. I, I think it, at this point, allow, it allows for options. I think that could be something that could be part of the discussion. Um, I don't really say one way or the other that is what will happen. I mean, I think the, the important fact to highlight here is that this is just providing groundwork for the zoning code to allow such a use in the area. Um, I mean, I guess I personally don't really have an opinion one way or the other, whether it's selling the village hall altogether or if it's to be moved across the, across the street. I don't know. But the, the important fact here is just to highlight that it's just laying the groundwork for such a use to potentially occur in the B3 zoning district. Okay. Thank you for that. Okay. <laughs> Question for Bo. Bo, I have a terrible echo. Can you reiterate, did I hear the word litigate in there in some point in time, realizing that you are an attorney? Are you asking me? You said Bo. Do you mean Bjorn? 
I meant Bjorn. I'm sorry. Again, I've got a terrible echo in here. So it's. Um, litigate as not literal, just a figure of speech. I thought maybe and, you meant and, mediate. Yeah, I, okay. Thank you. Uh, if I could rephrase <laughs> then, I would just say decide the, for, affirmatively decide the future of the village hall's fate. Okay, um, if Bjorn is finished, I believe you said Lars wanted to speak next. Yeah, I'll just give him my computer for ease. <laughs> oh, he's got spots. Okay. Hello, everybody, and um, thanks for holding this uh, hearing tonight. And uh, first and foremost, um, thank you all for all the many hours and and days and weeks that you put on put to put together ha, um, attending all of these uh, Zoom hearings. I know that it is very difficult um, to, to get to this point and you're almost at the finish line now. Um, but I think that uh, my son, um, he echoed our feelings um, precisely and as it, in regard to the tent um, situation in the current proposed, um, uh, proposed zoning ordinances. I think our biggest concern is, is that there's been such a demand for weddings throughout the county. This is not unique to Sister Bay. This is, I think you know that even with the number of weddings that are held on the grounds of the, of the village property and the tents set up here throughout the spring, summer and fall months on all of the village waterfront property. And then also some of the other events that appear uh, namely the, uh, I think the two bike, um, the organized bike rides uh, late this um, summer and early fall. Um, they too have large tents erected on the, on the waterfront. And uh, we don't object to any of those tents. And I think it's, it's good public policy to continue with those tents. But if that you're going to continue with those tents, then we in the B3 zoning district should be allowed to do the same under the same set of, uh, set of rules. I think to prohibit them, I think it was perhaps somewhat of a knee jerk reaction to begin with, because perhaps there were other businesses that were in violation or didn't follow through with asking the right people to erect those tents. But if you look at the various businesses in town currently, I think it's only uh, us and perhaps um, perhaps uh, the creamery. The creameries had a tent, I think, on both sides of their building, all 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 season. And um, it could be argued whether or not the the approved uh, awning or uh, tent that you approved for the boathouse is a permanent structure as well. So I don't know there, whether that is a, a tent or a canopy or what it really is. Um, but in any event, it's there and you, you approve that. Um, so I think going forward here, I, I think we see a, a zoning ordinance that looks quite good at this point. And it's something what we do know about zoning ordinances is that they can be amended and changed um, over the years. And not all of you will be sitting in that position. So I caution you as you go forward here to make sure you cross the T's and dot the I's accordingly. I, I do think that one, one other thing that I want to echo strongly is that I know you're in, in a transition period here shortly um, with our current uh, village administrator um, slash zoning administrate, uh, administrator leaving for another position. And I wish him well and, and congratulate him on on his new position. But in the same venue, I think it's important that as you uh, develop this zoning ordinance that you be very careful and that I think there is some language in, in throughout the ordinance that gives quite a bit of power to the plan commission and to the plan commission chair. Now I would encourage you to, um, as you're looking for the next replacement for the village administrator, I would encourage you to um, hire at least, or look strongly at least at a part-time zoning administrator. That position has become so difficult to be a true administrator and a zoning administrator as well. So I think Sister Bay has grown 
in such a fashion that it certainly could um, be argued that a part-time zoning administrator is necessary as you go forward. So I encourage you to look strongly at that uh, as a plan commission. And I would encourage you to, as my son indicated earlier, to give the B3 zoning district the opportunity to continue uh, with the tents as it's currently um, set up in the, in, in the zoning ordinance with the current regulations the way they are. So I thank you and I'll let, I'll turn this back over to Bjorn in case he has any other um, comments. And I don't know if anybody has any questions for me before I leave. Thank you, Lars. Okay. <clears throat> And I think that about sums up our position. So I can take any other final questions if you want. I guess not. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I do not have anyone lined up to speak next. That, that has to be impossible. <laughs> I'm just the messenger. I have no one interested in speaking next. Does Did we receive any that? written correspondence in advance? No. Nope. Boy, this is a first. This is a first. I mean, we have, according to the Zoom, it says we have 20 participants. That's that's one of the smallest we've had at a public hearing. And, and there is <laughs> some very major changes uh, in here. Um, hmm. Well, I just don't know what to do with two people speaking. I'm, I'm kind of at a loss. Um, Perhaps this was rushed through a, a bit. I mean, I realize it was publicized properly, but considering we've taken two items off of the agenda this evening, I... I too would expect much more, much more public input into what is going on. But it, it is, it is what it is. Um, <clears throat> I guess, um, I guess I will close the public hearing at a 620. Okay, maybe I should ask this question first. Um, Bo, if we close the public hearing now, will I be able to open it up later if I choose to do so? You want to have you if you have to schedule another, you'd have to schedule another public hearing, and you'd have to do all of the legal requirements to post with timing. But yes, you could open. No, I mean, in tonight's meeting, if I wanted to talk about other changes in the code, I couldn't reopen it. No. Okay, so then I'm going to choose to just stay then in the public hearing. Um, I, I spent many hours today um, going through the printed document of the zoning code um, and comparing it to um, what was um, published for the public hearing. And I guess I would like to go through um, some errors um, some minor uh, adjustments that we need to make, and then some questions that I also found um, throughout here. And uh, so that when we get to the end of tonight's meeting, that we will have then a document um, that we can uh, forward to the village board if we want to. So, Bo, is there a way? Um, I don't know how many people actually have a have a hard copy um, of this that they can look at, or if Bo is actually going to have to try to share his screen. Um, but on page seven, and it. And it was a question that I had once um, word was put to paper 
was exactly what um, Bjorn and Lars were talking about. And I needed clarification on did, was the plan commission's discussion, because we have talked about so much over so many months, and I'm sorry, I simply just can't remember everything. Was it our intent to outlaw tents throughout the village? Was that our intent with that wording when we had that conversation? <clears throat> I don't recall that phrase ever coming up or. There was quite a heated discussion about tents. You were very, very upset about something that had happened. And um, the way it's written to my recollection is the way it went down in conversation. Okay, because I was, I was upset about tents that were put up and there was uh, merchandise being or product being sold out of the tents. That, that is where I had that issue. So I would be very happy to keep the verbiage on page, on page seven that says the temporary sale of goods from a truck, trailer, table, or tent shall only be permitted as part of a festival permit. And then I think what we were looking for was a little more um, teeth, which was issued by the village board and or the parks, property, and streets committee. But I, I, don't believe it was my intention to ever say that in inclement weather or for um, a, a special event that a business would not be able to put up a tent as long as they came to the village for a permit. I, I don't believe that the village is looking for um, a community with um, a lot of businesses having tents up, you know, the majority of the season and, and our landscape is, is dominated by everybody having a tent. But if you get a permit, if there are um, rules that you have to follow, I think that's all okay. Yeah, the, Denise, we, the, the, the week of plein air, a couple of tents popped up by the door hotel and they had not permitted. And I'm thinking, and I'm remembering that that last sentence that we have in six just said, if you're gonna do a tent, you've got to run it through parks or it's gotta be part of either a village event or run it through parks. So we didn't say that that plein air thing was a bad thing. It's just that they put the tents up and they didn't, hadn't gotten any approval for it. Well, I think they might have gotten approval for it, but they weren't supposed to be selling anything out of it. I, Correct. Well, that. That's what I remember. Okay. okay. They did have the permit, but they, they were not authorized to sell anything out of it. So I think that's where that whole conversation came from. And so then once the words were put to paper, it didn't read the way I remembered it going down. Okay. So I'm in favor of returning it to what it was with the additional verbiage of um, let me see, issued by the village board and or the parks property and streets committee. And that has to do with the festival permit that is for the sale of goods, okay? But I think we need to come up with wording then that states that you can get a tent permit for your property. And if we want to cr create how many times a business can do that in a year, leave it open ended. They could have one, you know, seven days a week, six months a year. You know, that that would be a topic of, of conversation. But I that's where I would like to see this go. Does does anybody uh, agree, disagree with me? 
Are you asking for these changes tonight at this hearing? I'm going to be I'm going to be asking for a, a bunch of changes tonight after going through the the document as a whole. So I'm I, wondering who is proposing the language. Go ahead, Nate. I'm sorry. I wonder about having tents up all the time. I think that could be an issue. I think that we do need to have them out there. Something along the lines of like outdoor sales. Not saying that we the permitted the outdoor sales, but you're only allowed to have so many days of having an outdoor sale a year, if I recall correctly, it's like 14 or 20 days or something along those lines. And I'm not saying that we need to have it be that same number, but I think we should have a limited number of days that they can that, that can be put up. Otherwise we would have a tents up all the time. And I actually find the, the tents on village property, namely the one at Marina Park, far more objectionable than the ones that, that are, are on, put, being put up commercially. And that's just an oversight that, that we need to exercise as the village. Um, but that's something that, that, that's beyond the scope of this hearing. I, th I do think that we should have not, I, I agree with you about the, the, the sales of goods or services in a tent, but I also think that we should have a cap on it in terms of number of days. And I, I think that that number should be compatible with the tent going up on you know, before Columbus Day weekend and coming down after Fall Fest. And in that context, then the structures, as Lars referred to them, uh, canopy type or tent type that are in use and have been in use on a continual seasonal basis, how, do we not want to account for those? particulars still being allowed to go on that that do we agree that what we're not trying to say is all of those have to come down and if if we're in agreement that th that those type of permanent gathering spots should be allowed to continue as they do do we then need to look at something more substantive in terms of a quote unquote tent permit that would define further, you know, this is the type of thing that you could add to your business on, you know, not a temporary basis. You lost me somewhere in there, Rob. What What is your, what is it that you're asking? Hey, what do how do we go forward or do we need do we need to include in in revised language going forward that what we're talking about does not apply to the canopy at the boathouse the tent structure that Lars referenced at Stabor the canopy yeah. at the boathouse was permitted via right. structural design hearing. It's a part of the building that is used for a portion of the year. It, it, it's not a tent. Uh, except I don't remember us approving the, the stuff up on the second floor, just out of curiosity. No. I remember the first floor, but I don't remember what he's done over where the musician plays. So You're correct, David, that's been there for two or three years now, and no one has said anything, just like the side business going on the side of the creamery with the awning over it. Um, I thought I thought they asked permission for that side canopy. I thought we permitted those because of COVID. Okay. There, last year, there were a lot of things that uh, Dave Lino and Bo, I believe, permitted because of COVID. Um, this spring, I believe we were updated in Bo's administrator report that he was contacting um, all the businesses that had gotten, that had asked for special <laughs> signage or, or um, inclement weather or tents or whatever, telling them that um, that no longer applied. And am I correct, Bo? Yes, you are correct. Okay. 
can you tell us, did we approve? I have a vague recollection that we did approve the second story at the boathouse. Yes, I believe we did approve the second story at the boathouse. Um, I believe that was um, April, May, I think, 2020, if I remember correctly. Um, that was approved. Yeah, that was approved. And then I believe we also approved the awning that you guys are referencing. Right. We did not approve anything for the creamery, though. I believe we did. Well, then maybe it was at a meeting I was not at. Was that via a festival permit or a different type of approval? No, I believe, if I remember correctly, I think that went to plan, plan commission. Okay, so that would that were, were those approved as festival permits no. or something something different? Denise, didn't um, I can't remember his name. Who owns the creamery? Jesse. Yeah, remember when Jesse came in? And he said that he was thinking of doing all that remodeling, but for the time yes. period, for the time being, he was going to use a temporary tent. And you guys said that was okay. And if he oh, wanted, that was like two or three years, three years ago, was that not? Yeah, it was two years ago. He was, it was two years ago, but he was granted permission. And then that was he before the patio was, was completed, though. The patio is completed now. Yeah, and he was told if he was going to make all the changes, then he had to you know, come back if he wanted to amend anything, but he was granted permission for the temporary tents and the umbrellas and all that for shade. Okay, but he could not expand his seating, correct? Because then he would have had to have done some other things. I correct? thought he gave him permission for, for what he's done so far, but told him if he wants to do anything additional because he was talking about doing additional stuff Right. He had to come back. Okay. Janelle, will you make a note and pull that and you and I will talk about that sure. se separately? Can it be sent to all of the planning commissioners, please? What, the minutes from that meeting, please? Sure, I can do that. So that, that, that's what I was trying to drive at was it sounds like I'm hearing that at some point those were temporarily approved with a festival permit, but the temporary nature of it apparently has gone on for a number of years. No, it was not. The creamery had nothing to do with the festival permit. Okay, so the, so how were they approved for that? And how was the second floor of the boathouse approved? What the boathouse what was, was approved because it's part of the structure. It was an architectural review. That had to come before the plan commission and the boat house was a change to parking so he had to come before the plan commit or a change to seating so he had to become before the plan commission to make sure there was sufficient parking i think we set a maximum of 21 days a year that's a significant number that's going to let it go from the the, the weekend before fall fest to after fall fest and a couple times in between there we don't have these tents up all the time um it allows businesses to do what they need to do but it gives us some protection i don't know what anybody else's thoughts are i was going to try to um what did what did we limit that you were referencing before nate um i didn't I find it, was it flea markets it, Outdoor sales. I think uh, I looked outdoor sales and could not find it under that. Was it? Oh, do you remember this? Because this was a while ago. Yeah. yeah. It was like <laughs> sales on the. It was on sidewalk, but it was like adjacent to the sidewalk. Was, we were talking about on deck when we discussed it. Would they put racks out? Didn't we say they could only be out like? six times a year or 12 i don't know there was something it's 12 that's that's what i'm trying to okay. find yeah well then we brought up yenny and the fact that she has outdoor displays and racks quite often yeah but this was not about this was not necessarily about a rack it was about outdoor displays was that no you know Oh. 
I wish that you could share your screen, Bo. Can I can I jump in with a question, Denise? Or, yes. Okay. Um, since I was not on the commission at the time, Janelle, you you mentioned that the second floor boathouse canopy structure, tent structure, canopy, whatever, was approved based on a change in seating. No, the the boathouse was an architectural review. Because you guys okay. said anything. I, I heard you, I heard you say that. The, what drove the cream when Dave room. asked about when David asked about the second floor, you clarified that what drove the approval of the second floor canopy was a change in seating. I, well, if I said that that was wrong, I'm sorry because what the change in seating was at the creamery. I thought I said that the the canopy was at the boathouse, and that's because it was an architectural review. Because okay. the appearance of the outside of the building was changing. Okay. So then if any other business in town wanted Wants to, to add seating, they'd have to go before the plan. No, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm removing away the seating now. Okay. okay. So I'm sticking with, I'm just trying to draw a corollary between the question regarding the second floor of the boathouse as an example. Okay? okay. So if any other business in town wanted to come forward with, a plan similar to that, whether it was on a second floor or on a ground level, they could come forward under the context of an architectural review and then none of temporary permits for uh, temporary festival permits would apply? I believe so. It would be okay. real similar. Remember what um, Jody from Top did when he wanted to put up that big canopy? When he came before you guys and you gave him permission, it would be real similar to that. Okay. okay. Yep. I just I and that's I just want to make sure that what we're not doing is taking what has been viable for businesses that has previously been approved and throwing in an element of controversy where they wouldn't be allowed to continue. Yeah, I get what you're saying. Okay, so now I understand. Thank you. Uh -huh. Okay, so Nate, you are proposing that tents may be erected for a total of 21 days. Yes. Wow. Would you allow that contiguous? Um. I mean, I'm throwing a number out there to start with. I certainly could, that could be massaged up or down a bit. I, I, I understand your reservation on there because 21 days is a long time, especially if it's contiguous. I think you almost have to have it be 10, 10 days so you can incorporate those fall weekends because that the weekend before Fall Fest through Fall Fest is, is really the time that that happens in the village, and that's not the only place that it happens. And it, so you I think I'm it's just, very important for that yeah. period of time. Yeah, and and I'm just I was thinking in my mind though, how many times do we have these two weekends back to back? So yeah. instead of let's make sure we think about you know we know that the end of fall here is got something packed in. Um, what, what idea here, David? So what if we just make that a, a time that doesn't count towards it and we lower the number so we can say that those two weekends, because that's very consistently going to be the time people need tents. I like that as long as they still permit. So you have, you can do 14 days and or from Friday, five o'clock for Columbus Day weekend till Monday, five o'clock after Fall Fest. Something like that. And those 14 days could be, they don't have to be during special events. They could be any time as noted on the permit request. Correct. Correct. Yeah. And does it have to be just a tent? Can they be allowed tables as well? Mm -hmm. This is, we're only talking about tent regulations. Well, when I see on page seven that we referenced and what we took out initially, but started referring back to, it says the temporary sale of goods from a truck, trailer, table, or tent. Right. So 
my question is when we're talking now about the potential for tents being okay, how do people feel about including tables in that? But, but that's the sale of goods, okay? What we're talking about is just erecting a tent for a large event, a special event, inclement weather. We're not talking about the sale of goods. If you're still going to sell something from a tent, you can only do it with a festival permit. Could we please reference festival permit regulations under line 1415C wherever it goes to that so people know exactly what a festival permit is, what the regulations are for that? You need to get a festival permit is it through SBA ABO or is it through Heidi? And then Heidi gives it all to SBAA. Um, I believe it is through the SBAA. I don't think Heidi collects those. I think Louise collects those. The only festival permit that's issued by Louise is just Fall Fest. Anything right. else would have to go to parks or it would have to go to the village board. Um, yep. Actually, yes. Janelle's correct. Uh, parks. Properties and Streets reviews all events for the year, including the SBA event, and then gives the approval. So all events go through Parks, Properties, and Streets. So the, the re referral would come in, it would go to Heidi, she'd refer it to Parks, and then depending on what they do, that's what would happen. Does that answer your question, Mary Kay? Could it be as simple as see festival permits after that? I don't have a question. I'm asking to add something. It seems as though there's confusion in-house with what it is. Just see festival permit because, you know, people are saying, can you sell? Can you not sell? No, unless you have a festival permit, you can't sell. So if it's just a tent and you're not selling, you don't need a festival permit, but people should know where to go for that. Well, it says issued by the village board. So if they read that, they would contact the, um, we could add uh, verbiage, uh, application, um, applications or forms, um, something with the village clerk. Would that be helpful? I think anything would be helpful in that section to define what a festival permit is, as opposed to getting a temporary tent, which is now going to be regulated by the number of days. So we do need to tell people where to go. See this, contact village board for more information, something along those lines. All right, well, because fall fast I'm gonna just try to make this simple applications available from the village clerk. And if it has to do with fall fast, then the village clerk will direct them to SBAA. Cause I'm not gonna to try to add that wording. They can just all go through village clerk and then she will determine where they go from there. Is that fair enough? Should be. Is that okay, Mary Kay? Doesn't that just create extra work for the village clerk rather than having a section that you can go to to read what a festival permit actually is? It, it, it's in regard to the sale of items. So if we haven't defined it in here somewhere, then we, we should. All right, so we're adding a festival permit to the definitions. Okay, 
Um, in the spirit of unintended consequences, and since I don't pay attention to Columbus Day, is Fall Fest always the weekend after Columbus Day? It yes. is. Okay, thank you. So back to Nate's suggestion here, I would say um, that if we are going to exclude Columbus Day weekend and Fall Fest, that you are allowed to erect a tent the Wednesday before Columbus Day until the Wednesday after Fall Festival, giving some flexibility to set up and take down. And so if, does that wording sound okay to the Planning Commission? Yeah, I think, that, I think that's that's pretty generous with timing, but you almost have to do it because we've all seen some pretty terrible weather come in well before and after those holidays. Right. I'm good. Okay. And so then if those weekends, that time frame is uh, excluded, then how many days throughout the season do you think it would be then appropriate? And I'm I'm we're considering the season one, two, three, four. So June through so you got four months, 10 days that says that, or how many, how many weekends that's saying that they could yeah. 12 to 16 weekends, depending on how you break out the, the season. Yeah, 10 is pretty good. Plus, you get a free play at the end of the October. I'd be curious to know what Luis has, thinks about this, since you interface with businesses more than we do. Here we go. Sorry. Um, so two things. One that one is that going back to the original discussion you guys had. So is a festival permit a tent permit? If you it's going to be defined now, so you'll be able to like look and read and and see it. To me, it defines sales. Right. It defines sales. And I, I would suggest that. You call it what it is, because it, it, it's it's li it's likely, or it's possible, that it's not festival related. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? So it's possible. So I would suggest that, in in plain speak, it is um, it's a it's a tent or a booth. Call it booth. What's what tents are? It's what they you know essentially, but a tent or a booth <clears throat> permit. Um, and then, and so the tent, you could do a booth for sale of goods or whatever, because I, I think it's tricky, not tricky, but a little bit hard to understand or confusing maybe when, when it's called festival, because that's, exactly. it may not, you know, it may not be. So that's just one suggestion. Um, so as it relates to like, you know, how often will they need them? Um, or want them and you know I think I think a lot of good points were made um, and I think it 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 might surprise the plan commission that it's not necessarily weekends do you know what I mean I think that you may find that it's during the week when because weekends oftentimes are I'm talking about when, when I say that I'm talking about gatherings you know people wanting to gather and things like that because weekends oftentimes are are ones when they don't want to. So essentially you're right, you have 16 weeks. The, the month of June is kind of a one-off because you just never know about the weather. So 10 or 12 is, is probably fair, I think. Um, I think you always need to leave some flexibility, you know, because things happen. So, um, you know, things get canceled, things get, and and I think I think you don't you don't look at it as, as a season you th you you could look at it as a year, you know, because there are times when maybe not necessarily, but there are there are certainly tents or coverings or whatever that can be used when it starts getting a little chillier. Not that this isn't, not that you don't know that and stuff like you know, but but relative the season is is 16 weeks, but 
there are times when we could do things or a, a business could do things in December or something like that, you know? Uh, so I think it's, I, th I think it's, it's pretty fair. Um, and there's always a situation where someone would come to you and say, I've exhausted my, I'm making it up, but my 10, I have a special circumstance here. Mm -hmm. And I think the board has always been uh, open and, and open to listen, you know? Um, and remember too that in those, so, so you get the tent and then, so remember that the tent guy, a lot of times you don't have a lot of control over the tent guy. So the tent guy is supposed to show up on Wednesday or Thursday to install. He comes two days early or he's freaking late or whatever. And then he's supposed to come and pick up like two days later and he shows up whenever. So you need to sort of just keep that just take that into consideration because most of the times these are rentals and tent guys come when they feel like it and pick up when they feel like it. I'd I'll get, I saw your hand Rob. I want to comment on something that we, Louise said, you know, about the festival permit, but it's all tied in together because you can only sell goods from a truck trailer table or tent during a festival. That's why it's a festival permit. That's the only time that is allowed. So whether it's Fall Fest or something else that the village has going on, like Marina Fest. Yeah. You know, it's a festival. Those are festivals. That's why we have to use that verbiage. I understand your point. Yeah. Okay. And it has to be a village festival, i.e. you can't have one on July 4th because we have Freedom Fest the following weekend. I, I just need some clarification. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. The county, I think they allow 10 events per year in areas where a tent is not permitted, where it would be per se a conditional use. They do regulate that. Neighbors watch neighbors. That is correct. So they could have something on Freedom Fest because that is a, a village sanctioned event slash festival, um, but not on the 4th of July because we do not hold an event or festival on the actual 4th of July. So a national celebration cannot have a tent. You could have a tent if you just wanted some more outdoor space for inclement weather. You just couldn't sell anything for retail from. sales. I think is what what you're getting at. Correct. No retail sales. Yep. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Rob, I think Louise's point was very valid, and that's what I was getting at before. Is if if we're going to establish a number of days during the season when there could be a tent or a booth for, you know, why not define that for anything? And if somebody wants to use it for sales, then they get those days. And how many, if they want to do it during a festival, that's one of their days. If they want to do it another time. And, and my point about that, it should also be spelled out to include tables, for instance, to not, you know, we've got retail space across from the waterfront park that has gone vacant for years in a building. And we finally have possibly one purchaser interested in starting a business there. That for instance, the sign, it, it's not a good sp retail spot for signage. It's not a good retail spot for driving traffic. It's not a good retail spot for putting up, requesting to put up a sandwich board, anything like that. But if they're going to be doing business that benefits the community during the height of beach season and, you know, need to put or would like to put a table or two in front of their under that almost enclosed, you know. Uh, Rob, let me interrupt overhang. you. That, that is defined under outdoor sales, which they are allowed to do. This is a totally different thing. Right. Okay. So they're allowed to put out a table anytime they want for that. Yes, we have that conversation. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So I don't think 10 days is enough, um, especially if somebody, when you think about setup and takedown, I think if somebody had five events, 
and they did it middle of the week or the weekend <clears throat> that each of those events may require the tent to be up three days. Um, I would be much more willing to to allow it for uh, 15 days. You know what, I think that I was interpreting it differently, meaning I was, I know you said days, but I heard events. So meaning that you have 10 events, but each event might be you know, the, the, it's possible that the tent could be up for two days per event, because I will say that if you're renting, you're at the mercy of the guy that's coming to pick up the tent. Um, I mean, it, it happens. Usually they pick them up right away because everybody needs a tent and they're hard to find. But I'm just su suggesting that it, it, it may not be one, only one day if they don't own it. And it, in all likelihood, they, they don't own it if it's a big one. Correct. I'm gonna ask Lars, um, to chime in to, to this discussion. Uh, you've been listening to what we say, what we're talking about, and I want to know how you as somebody who does utilize tents periodically um, for different functions and in clement weather, um, what you, how you feel about um, specific days or having having a larger, having a number of days that you can do it or limiting the events? Hi guys, I'm talking on behalf of my dad here. I think our position here is more days, the better. I think the very important consideration here is unforeseen weather. I mean, you might get one season with potentially 30 rainy days and another season with only two rainy days. So you could have two different years where some arbitrary number may be severely permissive and then another year where it's severely restrictive. So I think just to allow a buffer, the more the better. I mean, we would lean more towards, I think, Denise's position of 15 days and just call it that as opposed to the, the number of events. Um, I think, yeah, the, the primary consideration here is mainly weather and as opposed to just X amount of events per year. So that's kind of where our thought is at the moment. Um, okay. I don't, I don't think we have a magic ball for a number at least tonight, but we would say more, more the better for us. Okay. All right. And, and as, as was stated by somebody earlier, I think it was your, I think it was Lars, you know, the zoning code is only written in stone until we decide to change it. That's correct. And yeah. So, um, okay. So then I, I propose that uh, we limit uh, tents, um, re, we reinsert um, the original Wording, the temporary sale of goods from a truck, trailer, table, or tent shall only permit it, be permitted as part of a festival permit amended ordinance 14308-12208. And then state that temporary tents are permitted for 15 days, a calendar year, and that all tents will be, or any tent can be erected the Wednesday before Columbus Day weekend through the Wednesday after Fall Fest weekend, not counting towards the 15 days. And that we add festival permit to definitions. And that the applications for the festival permits are available from, um, well, no, that can go away because we will define it. Denise, what about a timeline for the setup and takedown? That's already included in there. If their tent guy blows blows their, their, their uh, uh, buffer zone, that's unfortunate, but and I'm sure once this is implemented and people start utilizing it, 
uh, I would imagine that we might hear from people saying this is working just fine or no, could you extend it to 18 days or 20 days and we would take that into consideration in a, in a future in a future conversation, but for now. Um, that is that is the change that um, I think we have general consensus on is that correct. Yep. yep. Janelle or Bo, do we need a specific because we are adding this tonight do should we have a specific motion on this change um you can make the recommend recommendation at the end of the public hearing to approve as amended okay all right okay and i'm going to have to scroll through so wait a second, is Janelle the one who reads that back the way it's going to be written now? What I'll do, I'll um, prepare a, a draft document that shows all the changes that you guys are recommending and that'll be included in the next packet. So you'll, you'll at the end, you'll approve all the, the revisions that were made as presented on the condition that you accept them once you review it. Because we will see a final document before we forward it. Before to, you forward it to the board. Just so you know, Jim Salinsky mentioned that he had some questions um, when we move past the tent regulations. Okay, you can give Jim the floor. Jim, oh. go ahead. Oh. All right, thanks. <clears throat> I, I mean, are you done with that discussion? I didn't want to interrupt. Yes. Okay. All right. Thanks. Well, some questions and points of clarification. I'm just uh, looking through uh, about garages. Um, so, page 12, I can just go there, states for single family. Let me see where is it? Detached um, garage. Okay. At the bottom of that page. And I, I'm assuming we're using the page numbers that are up, up in the upper right corner? Yes. Okay. Um, so attached garages for single family homes uh, do not dominate and so on. So, you know, keeps it rather open. That's for R1. Then R2 on page 17, it states um, the 30% rule, but and that's uh, item four in the right-hand column. And then in rereading that, I noticed that that was specifically for multifamily developments. Correct. But, okay, but R2, I think it also allows single family for single families. And so I don't know that those are addressed here. So just, you know, a comment that you may want to lift some of that wording or consider there's a consistency issue I think I found between amongst these. Okay. And, um, and then R3, page 22, I think I saw the same thing, sorry. Um, page 22, detached garage, same kind of thing designed to minimize the visual effect. And uh, I think it's, you know, uses that does not dominate, um, which is fine. Right, that's item four. Um, and then R4, same thing, it addresses the multi, and that's page 25 addresses the multifamily, but doesn't address the single families, which I believe are an allowed or permitted use. Okay. Page 25. Um, so just a thought on that. And then I noticed um, some other comments. I noticed that you removed residential condos I, I, as a permitted use, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, from all districts? Correct. Okay. Um, the definition is still there on page 74. That may be for legacy uh, reference or something, but, you know, just as a note that the definition is still there, um, if you wanted to address that. And then, okay. I, I wonder, what's, uh, what's on page 74? The definition of residential condo. Okay. Okay. Um, and in, so that's gone well, in that's favor of the whole. Still have residential condominiums. Okay, yeah, that's what I that's what I figured. Okay, 
Um, and I guess we've moved away from that in favor of the hotel, motel, motel, condominium, and so on. And um, maybe it's just an, an ask for the explanation of why we've gotten rid of the residential condos, uh, because on the hotel, motel, it's also got that requirement that they be staffed for four hours a day. And, um, you know, anybody who's running a, an Airbnb wouldn't have that. And I understand maybe that's the goal. Um, but if you could give me some background, I'm, I'm curious about the reason for this change. For, for deleting? Yeah, the residential condo and then adding in that requirement that uh, hotel motel condos be uh, staffed for four hours. That's page 67 amongst other requirements. All right, let me look on page 67. I can try and explain the staffing, how that came up. Yeah, please. That, that's because we felt that it wasn't really a hotel condo unless there was staff there to, to maintain the premise. Um, we thought that was very important that there's not a that number of units without somebody there to oversee them for at least part of the day. Because we could foresee a lot of issues. You know, if you say you had 12 or 16 units out there without anybody on premise at all that that, that, that day. That's not something that we wanted to see in those zoning districts. There was quite a bit of conversation about that back in July, I believe. Yes, the like Birchwood Lodge, which is a condominium hotel, Scandinavian Lodge, which is a condominium hotel. They have a management company there on site many hours from the morning until nine or 10 at night um, in season um, when they are the busiest. And that is a, a, a true, what we felt a true definition of uh, a condominium hotel and that they, they were rented out most of the time. And what we were seeing is um, much smaller um, units coming in, but basically what it was, was a residential home that was VRBO'd. Mm. And, and that is, that is not um, what our intention is. Okay. Okay. Um, no, that's fine. I was just trying to understand the background behind that change. Um, that's, well, that's the extent of my question, except for one more, which was um, can I, on the door. Can I ask a question as long as we have counsel here, Bjorn being in the room? Uh, condominium is just a form of ownership. So hold on, hold on a second. I am not comfortable okay. with how you phrase Oh, that I'm sorry. I, no, I just, I, I you just truly. Really... You should not be referring to somebody who's in here as a citizen, as counsel. That is, that is yeah. very irresponsible on our part. You have to be very it's careful. Fine if Bjorn's Please here. accept my apologies. Okay. Bo, Bo, maybe you're the one to answer this then. Since a condominium is only a form of ownership, if and and I'm going back before your time, if somebody like Joanne Dumsick, who had cottages, wanted to do a residential condominium, would this prohibit that? I'm I'm saying yes, it does. I guess I apologize again, Bo. I'm I'm looking for a little bit more of an interpretation. I'm just thinking of different properties that that are you know multiple like cottages, you know that we do have in Sister Bay, and and saying not new condominiums, which which we had that huge discussion on, but something that already exists and would become a land only condominium. Is, is the intent that this would also strike that? And Denise, you can answer that. It, that would really be a yes or a no. Somebody like Joanne Dumsick. Yeah, where Joanne had all the cottages behind her, you know, if she behind had- her home, through, like, they, rent, they rented out transiently. 
right? Correct. Okay. And then your question is, would that, I got to look up the definition. Well, right now it says residential condominium, an individually owned residential unit in a complex or building of like units. Condominium owners own their own units, but share common spaces, amenities, and other resources. So she, but I think Mary Kay said residential condominium. That's what I just described. Okay. Is that under R or C? R. No, it's under R. It's on page 75. Yeah. Well, my printed version does not have page it's, numbers. It's under R. It's in page 74 of the packet, but 75 on the PDF. So, okay, an individually owned residential unit in a complex or a building. So hers would be considered a complex, who you're specifically talking about. Condominium owners own their units, but share common spaces, amenities, and other resources. So no, no. we also earlier on under condominium residential say that it cannot be rented for more than I forget how many days too. No, One this month. has nothing to do with with rental. I was thinking our, of our existing properties that have more than one dwelling on them and would prohibiting residential condominiums take that out like can you can you prohibit a form of ownership like that well she's in the r1 district correct i'm i'm just using that as an example because you know, if if you go down and out out and around, you, you will find other examples. So, I think that you're telling me that something like that. If it's a if it's a, a permitted use, would be a single family dwelling. So, if it's a single family dwelling in an R1 district, which Joanne Dumsick's property is in. Again, that's not Joanne's anymore. I'm using that as a hypothetical example. Right, right. but I'm saying that that, that, should be, that should be allowed. Because, because of the R1? because she's in R1 and it says single family dwellings are allowed in R1. But we're talking, I don't, I, but we're talking, I, I'm, I'm just going back to the multiple ownership, you know, should somebody decide, hey, I, I do want to transfer this to a family member or a perfect stranger. And now it's under condominium ownership. We have a shared driveway, which has to be maintained. We have grounds that we're going to split the cost on. I guess you'll have to ask the attorney that. Well, you are doing away with the residential condos, um, so. Well, in, in some districts, not in all. We, we're still allowing them in R2. Oh. Um, it's in the package, page 14. Okay, I missed that. Thank you, David. That doesn't really answer my question on ownership, but that is an attorney question. So thank you. Okay, um, then just one other question, because I know it came up in the Door County Medical discussion with the height limitation and there was some um, 
I think it was in Bo's note that um, it was allowed to exceed 35 because of, um, I forget the language, critical infrastructure or something. I'm not finding Essential that Essential services. That's because Essential. it's proposed. It, it's proposed in this document. I brought up in it during that, that it has not been adopted yet. So it is not legal yet for them to exceed that height until this document is approved, passed by the village board. Okay, and where is that found? Where is that? Um, it's under essential services, Bo, what? Um, I'm, look, I'm looking. Because I cannot do a control F in. Yeah. It's on page um, 63 and 64 of the PDF. It says essential service buildings include police, fire, and medical services. That was the additional language. Oh, that just defines an essential service, but we're does it um, state that those can exceed the, you know, whatever the... That is in the code. In fact, I can tell you. What did you say, page 63 and 64? Uh, for the definition, yes. Um, to answer Jim's question, it's on page 109 of the zoning code. It's in the modification mm -hmm. section and height modifications. Um, subsection C, it says um, essential services, utilities, water towers, electric power and communication transmission lines um, are all exempt from the height limitations of this chapter. Okay. So there's not a uh, maximum, it's on a case by case basis or something. Correct. Okay. Okay. All right. Very good. Well, I think that's all the comments I have. Thank you. And by the way, I like the uh, the charts that have all of the that, that cleans things up with the setbacks and so on. So a nice job on that. Okay, on page nine. Why am I struggling here with this document? where we are in the section of um, setback requirements from the water. I had in my notes that um, the setback averaging in developed areas and the setback averaging in undeveloped areas should be deleted. Um, we got rid of the setback averaging um, in, I think, every other section of the code, and yet this remained. Denise, this is page nine on the bottom, not nine on the top, correct? Correct. Yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to remember that we talked about, I, I just, you basically said you didn't want any averaging. It's, we, we go right from B to. Exceptions. Yeah. Does that make sense to everybody? We deleted it every place else. Yes. Um, just so you know, uh, 
when you're finished with this one, Chad uh, wanted to speak when he when he has a when you have a moment for that. Okay. Okay, Janelle, will you please make note that we are deleting uh, the setback averaging in developed areas uh, in its paragraph entirety. And we are also deleting setback averaging in undeveloped areas in its entirety. Yep, I got that. Thank you. Um, for my notes, Denise, what was your verbiage for that tent thing? I've got the temporary sale of goods from a truck, trailer, table, or tent shall only be permitted as part of a festival permit. Temporary tents may be erected. Is it on any privately owned properties in the village? For 15 days. Oh, Janelle, Janelle, can we do that at the end of the meeting? Sure, that's fine. Okay. Thank you. I just want to keep scrolling forward and, and get through some of <clears throat> some that's of these fine. notes. While I'm doing that, if Chad would like to speak, please go ahead. Hi, everybody. Good work on well. Yeah, great work on doing all this. I can only imagine how tedious it was. Um, I guess since you're talking about setbacks, which I wasn't, a, I didn't notice all that. Uh, what's the purpose of not having averages, like say on a street like mine, where you know all the houses are on the road, and if I have a vacant lot, that would have to be set back, but everything is out. Or in the downtown area where the businesses come out to the roadway, but anything to continue on a block would now have to be set back. Is that, is that what, what you mean? Or is that just all residential? Uh, well, I was, we were specifically talking about setbacks from the water, but in general, um, we did get rid of that. Um, I think in almost every section and felt that, um, that that was just the the appropriate thing to do and uh, especially in the in the transition district uh where most likely anything that goes on there which is your area chad um that almost everything is going to be a tear down and rebuild when it gets to that point and so that averaging would just would not would not make would not make sense and that we okay. needed that space possibly for sidewalks or green space if there were ever to be sidewalks there. Um, <clears throat> and that there might not be enough space if, if you did the averaging and pushed everything forward. Uh, I get that, but I guess it's pretending things are happening that aren't and until that happens, it's gonna, you know, averaging to me kind of like in the downtown area I don't know if that would have affected what we could have done at the filling station. Maybe we wouldn't have been able to do that because of setbacks where it fits in with everything else. If, if there was a, a, a lot within that, you know, even if it's the, the creamery, which is just a aluminum building, like if that's ever tore down, if they had to have to set themselves way back, they may want to. Right. But, but I don't see why they would want or have to, because it wouldn't, it would look funny to have some building set back and have that downtown feel. So I guess I don't understand the aesthetics point of that, but the main question I have is why in the B2 district would you make minimum size of rooms bigger? Um, you know, I know I can't build a house next to me now because of 2010 grandfather, which it's all houses still, no matter what the code is wanted to have happen. So if I build a commercial space, I'm probably going to put a bunch of apartments above it, but now I'm forced to make these apartments bigger, which, you know, for me to make these year round apartments for people bigger is not going to be more affordable or easier for me to do. What, What's what, the intent? What of, page what, does it? Are page you 38 on the purge 30, 38 in the packet, 37 on top. Uh, it shows bedrooms, efficiency, one bedroom, two or more. Maybe that's accessory residences. I don't know, but it, no, all that's it, deleted. It, it's deleted. But then if you say in a mixed use, if you go minimum in the principal structure residential. Yeah. Uh, that, so so if you have commercial above it, you can make or commercial on the bottom, you can make those apartments as small as you'd like up there. Or where 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 do they meet in? Because right now it's showing 900 for a one bedroom where it used to be 750. Well, granted, that's accessory. So I'm reading that wrong. But yeah, that's principal structure residential. Not right now. Mixed use residential and business is deleted. 
uh, that is wrong in one of the things that's wrong um, in that table along with other things. Um, because we are coming back to uh, revisit, revisit all of that. So we deleted all mixed use. Okay. And so, we're going to have a much bigger conversation of that in, in the near future. Okay. So then getting back to the setbacks on that road, what are the setbacks on that road now in the B2 district or what are the setbacks from the road in the B2 district? Well, um, so you're looking. So it's not at averaging anymore. The principal structure. Um, Is when it goes to setbacks, it just refers to front yard one. Okay, so then two. you have to look at page 38 below the table. One is 35 feet from the center line of the street right away or 15 feet from the property line, whichever is greater. So when you have very narrow roads in that old part of town, it's whichever one is greater. Well, the 35 feet is going to be greater, which makes it harder to build anything because of how narrow those roads are. Chad, that's and, a, no offense or anything, that's totally a, an attorney question because that's a taking. So again, like Denise said, this is something that needs to be flushed out more. And that's okay. And that's great. I hope it's flushed out more because I'm just wondering the intent because they're really small lots back there. So if you make it harder to build on them because of setbacks, it's going to defeat the purpose of anybody ever tearing them down or anybody building anything back there um, because they are small lots. Well, and I have a whole problem also with that. It even says um, principal structure residential because that shouldn't even be in there because we zoned out single family building new single family homes there. So it shouldn't, it shouldn't even be in there because we've zoned it out. And yeah, basically you're, you would allow a six unit apartment complex based on that principal structure residential, right. Or something. That's what that would technically be. Yes. Not a right. single family home. Yeah, not a single family home. Principal residential would be a, an apartment or a, a duplex or, you know, I don't know what fits in B2, a duplex, maybe not. But um, either way, all I know is I live here. I have a vacant lot next to me that used to be a house in the 50s that burned down. It's a great lot to develop one day. Um, it would be make way more sense to put a, a, a house on there rather than whatever big building I'm going to have to put on there because of the zoning code. But if you're gonna restrict it, you're, you gotta make it so you can actually do something on those lots because they are all small lots back there, or majority of them are. So these setbacks without averaging on a street that it's foolish not to average when they're already there. There's, yes, may they all get tore down one day? Possibly, but I'm gonna own mine until, you know, for the next hopefully 60 years of my daughter beyond that. So I doubt it. Um, I just don't understand why it would, make it more restrictive in that area when the goal was to create more. Um, anyway, I, I don't mind the 20% the green space, any of that stuff that, you know, that makes sense, but those setbacks really, really, you know, then you got to have your green space in the front, not in the back, whatever. But it, it seems restrictive in an area that you guys are, have, the village has always wanted more to happen. And you know, I'm not talking about building hotel condos around a loophole because I think there's a, a sham. So fix that. Great. Um, <laughs> anyway, those are my two cents as you go forward. Uh, keep up the good work. Um, I know it's thankless work, but I appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. I, I wrote a note and uh, <clears throat> um, we can, I'm not saying that we're going to discuss that in length tonight, but I did make a note of that, that I think you made some valid points. And as we readdress some of these um, other uh, sections that we're deleting in their entirety, because they require a lot more thought, uh, I will add that setback averaging in B2 to that discussion. Thank you. And, and I would look at all the business districts or like in the downtown where where things are close to the road. I, I don't know what those setbacks are. Maybe they're five feet like every business is or on the sidewalk like Husby's in the Bowl. But in, a, in an area where they all kind of, it is that way, it, 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 to me, it would make more sense to continue that look rather than have one odd building setback 35 feet when the rest are up at the road. That would look weird, but 
those are my two cents. Thank you, guys. Okay, thank you. All right, if you go to page 11 of the top right-hand corner page, we're in R1, and um, in the table under principal structure, uh, side yard, churches, 100 feet, we deleted churches from the R1, so that needs to be deleted. Correct? Yep. yep. I thought that we were told that a church can be anywhere. That was told to us specifically by the planner. You cannot stop a church from going in anywhere. Bo, am I right? No. I'd have to go back and look at the tapes from that meeting then because I'm positive that's what he said. Mary Kay, I know we've talked about it, but I don't remember the outcome or the discussion. I'd have to go back to and check. I just don't want to make that call without having that in front of me. We're allowing it in, in the B1 and in the countryside areas where there's much more space. But it I is think it's under freedom to worship in the Constitution. I think that's what we were told. But we recall that you said don't include it in this. In the R1. Correct. I'm sure of that. Yep, we're giving them two districts where they can have their freedom to worship. And then on page 12, um, the side yard, it's also there for churches, 100 feet. And then right below the table, there's the numbers one, two, three, and four. And, you know, I never noticed this any other place, but all of a sudden when Jeff Sanders put it into table format, accessory structures located in front yard require conditional use permit. I don't remember talking about that, but all of a sudden it was here under the table. And, and with the lack of um, teeth that we have in conditional use permits, I, I don't think that that number four should be there at all. Accessory structures should I don't, we I say don't that. Did he just pull it out some standard language that he had and just got in there accidentally? Correct. Yes, he just he, he threw the table together to get that done. He didn't have all the information didn't have enough time to go through and pull all the information. So some of it's just standard language. Okay. So do we, are we in agreement that that number four needs to be deleted from the code? Yes. Sure. Okay. You got that Janelle? Uh -huh. Thank you. You had asked me about the the principal structure minimum floor. I think I thought that was pulled out, but I didn't know if there was a conversation since then. I see that, like you said, it's back in here. Can we strike that now? Right, but then the more research I did, Nate, I found that that had to do with accessory residential. And that's where I found that we deleted it in those tables, you know, the 750, the smaller square footage, we deleted that out of the accessory residential, but I don't think we ever actually changed it in the one, two and three bedrooms. Now we can, re, we can add that to the list to revisit that moving forward in that bigger conversation of, um, we did Everything. have the conversation about this. It may not have made it into code, but I know we did have the conversation. And then right. I think I was going to come back after at the next meeting. And maybe I missed that meeting or maybe it didn't make it into the changes. It's going to come back the next go round, but it was not going to be part of because this change was supposed to really rely more on the conditional uses. So this is in phase two. Thanks, David. I'm, I'm remembering this now. Between all of us, we can remember something. Excellent. And all of <laughs> us can remember so many about 80% of, us. of it. Oh. Okay, so on page 15, 
Um, we also, um, our two district lot standards um, in that first under line 31, it says minimum open space. Well, we don't define anything as open space anymore. It needs to be changed to green space. And then we also have side yard churches, which was deleted out of the R2 district at 100 feet. Then if we move to the next page 16, we have side yard churches needs to be deleted. And again, we have um, number four under the table, accessory structures require conditional use needs to be deleted. Are all those deletions okay? Yep. Yep. Okay, we get to page 20. In the R3 district lot standards table, again, minimum open space should be green space. We have side yard churches, 100 feet to be deleted. We have side yard churches, rear yard to be deleted. And again, number four, accessory structures located in front yard require a conditional use permit to be deleted. Are all those okay? Yep. All right, uh, page 22. <clears throat> Item number seven, street trees shall be planted by the property owner. The word provided needs to be deleted. So we're grammatically correct. Also on page 22, line 35, in the R3 district, Attached garages, the S on districts needs to be deleted. L page 24, R4 district lot standards. Under line 16, minimum open space needs to be changed to green. Then under structure standards, the minimum floor area of one bedroom, two bedroom and three bedrooms, there's two different square footages. The 850, 900 and 1100 were already deleted out of the code. It was a duplication. And then highlighted here, the plan commission must decide what they want the minimum floor area of a pr principal structure to be in the R4 district. Who, whose question is that? What is that? That was a question that Jeff had. So he wants you to address those square footage things that are highlighted and then that's the question. Okay, well, okay. Well, then that can be deleted because those other things were deleted. So you want all the minimum floor area stuff deleted? No, it's the 850, the 900, and the 1100, which we deleted out of the code text. But for some reason, he inserted it in there along with the 9,000 and 1200. Okay. So minimum floor area, one bedroom, 850 comes out? Yep. 900 stays in. Correct. Okay. Minimum floor area, two bedrooms, 900 stays in, 1,000 comes out or the other way around? Other way around. Okay, so 1,000 stays in. And then minimum floor area, three bedroom, 1,100 comes out, 1,200 stays in. Correct. Okay. And then we have number four, again, accessory structures, conditional use permit needs to be deleted.
Okay, we get to page 28. <clears throat> Countryside one district lot standards, minimum open space needs to be changed to green space. Again, at the end of the tables, number four needs to be deleted. Okay, page 33, line 38. This is permitted accessory uses in the B1 district. I had a question mark there. And unfortunately, I don't remember why I have that even though it was just this morning, I read it. So if I can't remember, and it was a question mark, I'll just move on. Um, page 34, we go to the table again for the B1 district. We change minimum open space to green in both sections, lot served by public sewer and the one below it, lot not served by public sewer. And if you look at lot served by public sewer, it says 20% of the lot shall be left as green space. And then in the table below it, lot not served by public sewer, we have 20% of lot. So I think we need to be consistent and add shall be left as green space the same way it is one square above it. Did you get that, Janelle? I don't wanna to move too fast for your notes. Yep. Okay. And then we have accessory residential use where we need to delete uh, the minimum floor area for efficiency one and two or more bedrooms. We deleted, we deleted that out of the code, correct? Mm -hmm. So that whole section comes out? Yeah, in that table. So on page 35, um, on the table for B1 accessory structures, we have side yard and rear yard, but we do not say that the setback must be green space, where we have said that in every other section. So I believe that um, we should add that. Agreed? Yep. Yeah for consistency, okay. And then again, we have number four, accessory structures, conditional use permit that needs to be deleted. Page 37, in the B2, downtown transition district. I remember having a lot of conversation about um, liquor stores and they, in the current code, they are under conditional uses. And it was, it was deleted. I thought our conversation was 
that until that area becomes more commercial than residential, that liquor stores should remain conditional. Yes. Denise, I'm not even seeing this. Where are we again? Because you are correct, but where is it still stated? Uh, on page, page 37 at the top. 37, and it's liquor stores is in red with a red line through it. Let's see, it's on line 18, Mary Kay. Right. Okay. So we took it out. We took it out. That's stricken. But we, I thought we wanted to. No, because we could be, until it truly becomes a business district right now. Okay. It's not, it's not oh. a conditional. That okay. was, that was a discussion. It was not going to be a conditional use. Okay. Is it going to be a permit? Cause then it's a permitted use. Someday. It was just no. going to be gone. Am, am because I right? That would liquor store then would fall under retail general use. Uh, no. No. We talked about, because we said, wouldn't it be nice to be able to go in there and get a glass, get a bottle of wine, but until the district truly becomes a business district, we were right. saying, no, we don't want a liquor store. So it's, and I don't think liquor, I don't think retail general use includes liquor. Does it? It does in, it does in the B3. Ugh. Yeah. So I, I want to make sure that we're, we're, we don't have unintended consequences from, from deleting it because it basically would fall into a retail general use that would be permitted. But under the current, and this is bringing up the ugliness of the new, of the act, if we say that it is a conditional use, are we pretty much saying it's gonna happen? Yeah. Yeah. But at least we have some control. Well, tell Chad he can open a liquor store. <laughs> <laughs> He's still listening. Well, don't we have taverns and cocktail lounges still in this district also as allowed? So why would it be transitional then? Oh. In the B2? Yeah, line, line four. Hey, I'll chime in since I was brought up. I think you've seen the nature of liquor stores in the world and they just seem to be disappearing because like in Wisconsin, you can actually go to a gas station to buy a liter of vodka and hop in your car. So <laughs> I wouldn't spend too much time on somebody wanting to open up a liquor store back here. So why don't you just say, no, I don't. Because I doubt if the land use would ever justify a liquor store for the value, but that's just my two cents. Good luck. Thanks. So should we just put it back under conditional use and just let it be and? Yes. Okay. Then again, when we get to the B2 district lot standards, um, in the first square, it says lot, business, use, or mixed use residential and business. We have deleted mixed use residential and business. So that needs to be deleted out of that first square. Does everybody see that? Mm -hmm. It's yep. underline 67. Then again, we change open space to green space. And then under structure standards, we have mixed use residential and business that needs to be deleted, including uh, the maximum height and the minimum floor area.
if we go to page 38. Okay, but Denise, now on that structure standards, do you still want principal structure business? That's the maximum height, right? Yes, it's so the it's principal the structure, structure mixed use residential okay. and business. Okay, I gotcha. Okay. And then on page 38, uh, the first square in the table is accessory residential use, which we have deleted. This is one that highlighted area Jeff wanted you guys to address. What the number, the number three there right next to it? No, where, where it's highlighted at the bottom of that table in the B2 district. Oh yeah, yeah, I'm just not there yet. Okay. Um, so under minimum setbacks, under the principal structures, um, it says side yard, that area must be green space. We have rear yard access, street access, and alley access, but it does not say that that area must be green space also for consistency. So I believe that wording should be added. On rear yard alley access lot? Yes. Can you describe an example? Because I don't see how you could make an alley green space. So you're going to have some impervious surface there no matter what. Right, but inside that alley access lot, whatever your rear yard is, that must be green space, not the alley itself. Because every place else in that table, it says that area must be green space, whether it's side yard or rear yard. Do you see what I'm saying, Mary Kay? I do. I think we talked a lot about Sturgeon Bay when we talked about that. I'm trying to think of a Sister Bay example. I mean, we don't really have one for Allie. I don't even know why Allie's in there if we don't have any. It's a hangover from Oak Creek. You mean from Bob? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was trying to be polite. Duly noted. I mean, at some point in time when, when we, you know, go through this whole thing, I'm sure that there are going to be a lot of little things that just go away because they simply do not apply. So now when we get to that highlighted area that um, Jeff Sanders was asking, if under number one, it states that 35 feet from the center line of the street right away or 15 feet from the property line, whichever is greater. And then it, the next sentence starts, except where a parcel adjoins the side light line, it talks about set backs being averaged. Well, if you go to the next column, line number eight, you can see that we deleted all of that wording. Mm -hmm. So And then front yard setbacks, it's the same thing under number two. 
if you scroll down to page 39, starting on line 54, 55, all of that was also deleted. So his questions are, are simply not valid. Yep. His questions were given to us because he felt that they were state statute and we should take a strong look at them if you'd go back to that. Just because we're a village, we can't make unilateral decisions from, from state statutes. I don't, it says nothing about state statutes here on setback averaging. No, I think it's case law. That's why it's all highlighted. I don't remember that conversation at all. Can somebody else refresh my memory? No. He said a lot of things where he's, he said you'd want to pay careful attention to that because there's precedence in this. I mean, go if you go through the tape, he, he cautioned us a number of times on various things, but you know, he didn't, you're right, he didn't reference where to look or where to go. And then if you look on the top of the right hand side of page 38, the other yellow, the plan commission may grant a waiver where the adjoining properties owner and owners enter into a written recordable agreement agreeing to a lesser setback. Um, and I've written over that, I can't even read it. Um, we deleted that on the same page on line 35. Right. We talked about Third Street in Sturgeon Bay that they, they were able to, if that were to happen, we were okay with it. Where, did, where is that? We did add that wording. I cannot remember where it is, but we did define that wording um, that we would grant a zero, and maybe we just haven't gotten to it yet. Um, okay, I thought so. But there was, we, we changed that wording to be very specific of what we were looking for. In the B3. Yes, okay. Okay. Okay, on page 42, starting on line 45, which is number five, exemption, when the app, and I don't know why this is typewritten in a totally different font, when the application of the off-street parking regulations specified above result in a requirement of not more than three spaces on a single lot in the transition district, such parking spaces need not, need not be provided. And I have a note on my, that we deleted this on my hard copy. And why everybody thinks about that, I have to go get something to drink, excuse me. What page is that on? I'm sorry. Uh, 42. 22 or 40? 40, 
42. 42, okay. What was the determination? I don't remember talking about this. Oh, did everybody leave? I think so. <laughs> oh. I think you called no, a break without knowing it. Yeah, I think a couple people went one oh. break. Okay. My, my battery is running low, but I can still hear all of you. And I just plugged my computer in. Incidentally, so Denise, I'm not leaving. I'm just getting up to stretch my stenosis. No worries. Here. So At the end, Denise, do you want to do additional grammatical cleanup or is that something we should just send in separately? Uh, do you have a hard copy of those changes of uh, the group yeah, gramma yeah. grammatical stuff? Yeah. Um, like periods and commas and things of that nature. Misspellings, gram grammatical errors that words that don't belong together, that kind of thing. Okay. If you have a hard copy of that, and if all it is, is grammatical, I would say just turn that in um, to Janelle. And I think it would be easiest then instead okay. of us going through, you know, 60 pages or whatever it is. Um, Thank you. Bo, do you know why that this is written in a totally different font? Um, I don't off the top of my head. My best assumption is when we had to convert some of the stuff, it just got a little difficult. And that was probably just something that we just didn't address or didn't notice. Okay, so could that also then be that that's why it's deleted on my hard copy, but not on this one? Janelle, would you know when you did that conversion? This is anything that was crossed out, you know, I left alone. This was like that. Um, it certainly could be that it was crossed out or grayed and that didn't print. So I can just cross it out if you guys, I mean, well, want Well, I, I want to have consensus from the plan commission if that, if, you know, we deleted it elsewhere. I don't remember talking about it and it really doesn't make any sense to me. So I'd be happy to have it go away. Okay, that's one. I agree. Fine with that. Okay. So that whole sub five goes away then? Yes, please. Cool. Okay, we are now on page 45. And this is, I think this might be a new conversation. I'm not sure. And, and I apologize um, for introducing a new conversation. But in the permitted uses in the downtown business, we have bed and breakfasts. 
we we have zoned out single family homes a bed and breakfast as defined you know it must be owner occupied and then you know they rent out the rooms in their home does does that make sense to be in the downtown district No, it does not. Not too many homes down there. Mary Kay? I think there are two homes. So I'm... I'm not against striking that. Okay. Okay, we will delete bed and breakfasts from the permitted uses in B3. All right, page 47. Again, in the table, we need to change open space to green space. And then minimum, minimum setbacks. Uh, if you look under accessory structures, the rear yard street access lot and the rear yard alley access lot um, one is six feet and one is eight feet. But after that, it says scene number four. There is no number four. So that needs to be deleted. And here's where it is, David, in the number two. If the buildings on adjoining lots will abut one another and are visually compatible and complementary, the plan commission may allow the affected property owners to enter into a written recordable agreement that establishes a zero foot side, zero foot side setback. Got it. Now, <clears throat> Jeff has additional wording in there, a reduced, or if applicable, even a zero. I don't think our intention was about reducing it. If they wanted to abut, we would go to zero, period. This is not about reducing anything. This is about a look similar to Third Avenue in Sturgeon Bay. So I would like to strike Jeff's wording, a reduced or if applicable, even out of that paragraph, because those were not our words. He added that. Agreed. Mm -hmm. OK. I'm still scrolling. That's a good sign. Lots of pages with no comments on it. Okay. <coughs> All right, now we're into definitions. And I don't think that there's a whole lot
Okay, page 65. And line 52. This is where we have the same verbiage multiple different places. <clears throat> um, where we talked about including overhangs, uncovered steps and stoops and gutters, and deleting awnings. We just on line 52, we need a comma after overhangs and the word. Um, and after steps and stoops, the word and, and a period after gutters, just to clean that up. Uh, page 74, line 34, the word bounded just needs to be bound. Okay, page 78, line 46, again for continuity, including overhangs, uncovered steps and stoops is deleted, but it should not be. So it shouldn't say including? It should say including overhangs, uncovered steps and stoops. Uncovered steps and stoops is deleted, but it should be included. And then and gutters, right? Yes. And awnings then gets deleted. Okay. <clears throat> Page 79, line 67, under transient condominium, the just needs to be capitalized. And that's all I have, folks. Denise, um, in the plan commission, did you want to have a conversation from something discussed in the public hearing um, about the assembly halls in B3? Um, I personally do not, but um, if somebody feels that they would want to have that conversation, I certainly would be. Um... I don't think that we should have that conversation. I don't either. I would rather, I, I know there was a lot of discussion a couple of years ago. I mean, maybe we can put it on a future agenda, but I think for right now, let it go. I agree. Future thought, maybe. And, and we can certainly add that to a future conversation um, <clears throat> because we're gonna be talking about this zoning code for, for quite some time. Was there anything else you had, Bo? Nope, that was it.
Okay. Um, with some of the changes um, that, uh, granted, a lot of them were were minor and corrections. Um, I will uh, entertain any other comments from anybody that is uh, with us tonight before I close the public hearing. This may be the longest open public hearing I can recall with the fewest people. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but well played, Denise, well played. Okay, you have nobody raising their hand or anything, Bo? No. Okay. <clears throat> then at 8.23, I will close the public hearing. Uh, does the plan commission wish to speak on anything that we have done that they feel that they have not been given uh, ample time to comment on or anything? I'd like to see a corrected draft of this document before it's adopted. I, oh, yeah. I really, truly really would. Yep, we will. Janelle will make the changes and um, <clears throat> Janelle will send it to me. Actually, Janelle, would you be able to print out a hard copy so I can go back through all of the notes that I took to make sure that we have addressed everything um, before it is sent back out um, as a revised? Sure. Um, or do you want actually, to address it at your next meeting? Yes. Okay. So when I get that hard copy done, I'll let you know. Okay, and we'll, and when you make these changes, you can't put it back into the share drive, can you? Um, no, because this is formatted differently. Formatted different, okay. Because it's formatted okay. to go into the code itself. Right, okay, I was just clarifying that. So yeah. then if I, if, if I notice anything, then you and I will just have to work on it together um, in your office then so you can, if there was anything that was missing or, or whatever, and then you can type it in right into your document on the computer and then it can go out to plan commission. Yeah, otherwise I can send you the word version and you can turn on track changes. Oh, that's fine. Okay, I'll do that. Okay. Okay, are we, uh, are we done? Are we looking for a, a motion to adjourn then? Well, what about agenda item number two? Is I don't know, I day? don't even know what the agenda says anymore, Janelle. It just, okay. It says, okay, so it says a re report by the zoning administrator. I don't know why that's on there. I don't have anything new to report, so. Okay. Okay, I thank everybody for their time. This actually did not go as long as what I thought it would. <laughs> thought we'd be here well cl way closer to 10 o'clock um i thank um those who chimed in uh listened spoke and um all the plan commission's hard work and we have one more round to go and hopefully we will have a finalized document uh, i will make a motion to adjourn at 8 26. one thing so, i just want to throw out there the the, the the Thursday meeting is canceled at this point, correct, Bo? That that is. Yes, I out. haven't sent an email out to Plan Commission yet. Is that just uh, happened? It might be a good time to tell Plan Commission while we're in the meeting. Okay, well we can do that. Well, Plan Commission is canceled for Thursday. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Motion by Berta. Who seconded that? Second, Gretzmacher. Okay, Gretzmacher. All in favor, respond with an aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you. Good Can night. Wait one second. Me? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, so. Oh, that thing. Yeah. Oh. Okay, so it's the temporary sale of goods from a truck trailer. Okay, let me pull that back up. Okay. I think that was on page seven where I took my notes. No, it's not on page seven. It's on... Um, Page at seven at the bottom, 660302. 
So it's sub six. On the <laughs> yep, got it. Okay, I've got the temporary sale of goods from a truck, trailer, table, or tent shall only be permitted as part of a festival permit. Temporary tents may be erected on any, now do you want it to say any privately owned properties in the village? No. No, take that out. Well, on where any, does? Okay, temporary tents may be erected on any properties in the village because you're gonna run into problems with the parks if you don't say privately owned. Because then people could just go put up a tent. Oh, okay. Okay, so if you say any privately owned properties in the village for up to 15 days in a calendar year, is that right? Yes. And also may be erected, now this is where I think I'm wrong, from the Wednesday prior to Columbus Day through Fall Fest weekend, is that right? And no. that time period shall not count toward the 15 days? It's Wednesday before Columbus Day weekend. Okay. Wednesday through the Wednesday after Fall Festival. Okay, so from the Wednesday prior to Columbus Day weekend through the Wednesday after Fall Fest. Okay. Yes. Okay, because I thought that otherwise they're going to have to take their tents down on Sunday and that would be a pain. No, that and that simply wouldn't happen. Okay. And um, that time period shall, oops, shall not count toward the 15 day limit, right? Correct. Okay. So then if I'm interpreting that right, say like Al Johnson's wants to put up a tent for 15 weekends for 15 Saturdays out of the summer. They could do that. They don't need to come to the village office or do anything. It's just up there, right? No, there will be a tent permit. Okay, so, um, so then we got to change that wording. Temporary tents may be erected on any privately owned properties in the village for up to 15 days in the calendar year if the property owner obtains a permit from the village? Yes. yes. Okay, a tent permit from the yeah. village. And I don't know that we have one of those written. We just use a um, zoning permit form and check other. Okay. So, okay. okay. Okay, that's fine then. Then I got and it. Then, and then we do have to add festival permit to the definitions. Yep, that I got. So we're, okay, so we're going to have to come up with some, some wording for that. And I don't know, I mean, maybe, is it just as easy to use the zoning permit for tent or is it easier to just have another tent permit that's much smaller and less boxes or do we just use what we have? Um, it doesn't really matter. Technically, we just have them check a couple boxes and they leave all the rest blank. Okay, that's fine. It just, it makes it e easier to not have to worry about what form you're using. Okay, perfect. I just want to make it as simple as possible then. Yeah, because otherwise people are like, well, where do I find that form? And sure. if it's all kind of a one-stop shop, that works better. Okay, or we can change the form instead of other, we put a box for tent. That would work too. Why don't, why don't we ask Heidi to, okay. to do that? And Heidi sent me an email and I didn't have the opportunity to tell her tonight and I won't have an opportunity to call tomorrow. Um, but uh, her email said, um, let's see, where is it? Oh, too many emails. Um, would you please take a minute to look over the attached revisions to the facility use application and let me know if this is okay. I've always been told I could not change the format of the original application, but I decided to throw caution to the wind and really shake things up. <laughs> <laughs> And tell her at first glance, I think it's great. She can keep moving forward. Okay, I'll tell her. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Janelle. Have a good night. You too. See ya. Bye. Bye. Bye.